What's up everybody, this is Herschel Froome from High School Top 200 and this is the Top 200 Podcast, the Monday morning meeting, back again um, after a little bit of a break, uh, a few weeks now, um, I was on sick leave from my own company, pretty much because I thought I had COVID, it felt like COVID, or I, I felt like what I think people describe COVID as, but it was strict. And I had it for two weeks. Couldn't eat or anything like that. Couldn't talk. Lost my voice for about maybe five days. I couldn't really speak. I was like whispering. Like ASMR kind of stuff. But I got real sick. And uh, for about a week and a half and then sort of just recovered. And then still kind of recovering even now. And, uh, yeah, I had my COVID test and everything, and it said that it was negative, so I was all good about that. And so, like, I've had uh, a few weeks off just trying to get better, all that kind of stuff. But still, like, um, still kind of active uh, within my own thing. Still trying to figure out how next year is going to go, um, if I'm even going to do this next year as well. Uh, because there's a lot of things that go into it, you know, um... Uh, a few opportunities and stuff like that that I have to sort of think about and 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 weigh up how much um, how much giving away this uh, changes sort of the landscape of things in terms of rugby because and and here's something that like um, a lot of people don't really think about that much and it's only because it hasn't really brought a lot of attention to it either like there's no real attention around this uh because someone like myself is doing it for one and like everybody knows this since i've been doing this is that because i'm not really i'm not a name i don't have uh you know uh, an ex pro career as a player or as a uh, a coach or anything like that um uh, pretty much like you have this pretty much in new zealand and this is this only really happens in new zealand is that you have to have some kind of credential or status for people to believe and to understand what you're saying and for you to be taken seriously. They can't just look at your work and what you've done and go, oh, this person's got something to it. Do you know what I mean? Like you have to be validated in the same way by a bunch of people or by, you know, an entity that is uh, that is the controlling factor around this, which in New Zealand is NZR. And um, because they haven't said anything about it, people are too people that work for them that ask me for help are too scared to say anything because then it validates me and then you know gets them in trouble with their company, which I understand. Um, but uh, the importance of keeping this around is that it shows how it shows how young the game is getting and how important it is that younger guys get noticed and get that advantage of of being um recognized and validated and uh put on a scale for the next year when they leave school and then go into professionalism now a lot of you guys right now are probably thinking well that's wrong because you shouldn't be doing that to young guys but then next year you're going to find a whole bunch of kids that are already playing npc like i just watched harry godfrey play uh for hawks bay and he should have been at school this he could have been at school this year again but he's already playing for Hawks Bay. And he's not the only one. Like, there's, there's guys that are... I mean, even if you take someone like Josh Lord, who was at school, like, two years ago, and uh, uh, Tupov I, who was at school three years ago, and then, you know, and when you think about those kind of those kind of ages coming from my era of things, is that you never, you never, pay, you never played NPC or even got picked up by those um, provincial teams, unless you were five years and five years out of school and you were in your mid twenties, and then you know that kind of stuff. That's when you started getting picked up. Right now, you're getting picked up at high school. You know, like you're getting picked up at high school. I mean, Ruben Love's already made a name for himself already. You know, Caleb Clark didn't take him long at all. It took him pretty much a year out of school, and and so like. Thinking of it like that, something like high school top 200 and having a top 200 rankings gives 
gives people a um, uh, some context around what is actually happening in New Zealand first 15 rugby and how high of a quality this game is here in New Zealand where guys can leave school and then the next year be playing for an NPC side and be not so much just fast-tracked, but also being put on notice straight away for the Super Rugby sides. Now, if you're not really watching High School Top 200, as a fan, you're looking at these young guys coming through and you're like, oh, wow, this guy's... You know, he's just come out of nowhere. Where it's like, if you've been watching from high school top 200, you've already seen the progression of all these guys. Even if you haven't seen them at school, you've been following them on my website. And you've been seeing where they're ranked within my website. And then you're saying, well, once they get into the NPC and then you see them playing on the field, you're like, oh, shoot, this is the guy that Herschel was talking about. Or if you just see them one time on TV and you go, oh, yeah, Herschel talked about this guy. Then he makes, you know, rep teams and secondary schools and all that kind of stuff. And then he goes straight into these NPC sides and then starts performing for them. These are the things that, um, that to me, bridges the gaps between um, the, the realistic view of what professionalism is here in New Zealand and in rugby. Now, I feel like NZR have this fear of saying and coming out and just saying, yeah, we, we track them from high school. And I'm not too sure why. I'm not too sure why they're scared of that and why they why they don't want to say it when they're actually doing it anyway that's what rep teams are that's what rep rugby is well you think rep rugby i don't know if what you guys think rep rugby is is like if you think that it's just like a fun you know uh achievement to gain it's like no that's it's not even that at all rep rugby is so that they new zealand rugby union can track who all the boys are coming through and who are the good ones and who are the ones to keep an eye on and you know that kind of stuff they don't do it for the achievement of of kids not at all so like the public perception of how of what these are is it's like oh you know there's this big achievement it's like no new zealand rugby is just making sure that they're keeping a track of everybody that's all it really is but I don't know why they don't just come out and say it. And why don't they just admit that it's like, yeah, that's what we're doing. It's just like, that's what every league does. That's why Barcelona take kids who are 14 and move them from one country to another. Because they're just keeping a track of all the talent and making sure that they are staying ahead of everything. You can argue it's not doing anything different. They're just doing the same thing. Basketball, like NBA is the same way. NFL is the same way. They keep a track of all the, you know, the... Um, Max prep schools and uh, max, max prep uh, uh, scouting and all that kind of stuff as well, making sure that the ESPN uh, top 300 and top 200 and you know top 100 football players and basketball players are all kept um, uh, up to date on who's coming through. That's why we can see what you know Bronny James is doing right now as a junior in high school and where he's ranked and then where he'll be ranked next year and then you see where they're going to high uh, where they're going to university and what scholarships are picked up and I don't know why New Zealand rugby don't do this because this is exactly the same thing of what I'm doing is that I'm making sure that everyone keeps a track of where everyone is going and what is actually happening what the landscape looks like when those guys do their when those guys are doing uh, their job in terms of making sure that talent stays around. Now, I don't know why they don't just admit that kind of stuff. And I don't even know why they don't even just acknowledge that I am what I am doing is a massive benefit to what those guys want to achieve anyway at this level. Uh, it's like... Um, it's like they don't want to admit to, you know, uh, um, a practice in which they're doing, which they feel like... And in, in, in the community, it's wrong. But when they turn 18, it's all of a sudden okay. When, when, it's, when it's just, you know, I, I don't know how people kind of look at it and how people kind of see it uh, and how they read that picture of, like, what rep teams are and what national honours is. But that's exactly what it is. It's just New Zealand rugby trying to keep a track of everything. Even though it's run by, like, New Zealand barbarians or the... Um, NZ Secondary Schools Council or whatever it is, it's still for New Zealand Rugby. And it's still for them 
to stay ahead of the game of who's who's coming up in rugby. And I mean, boys' schools and private schools also make it easier by, you know, handing out scholarships. That's why they don't want to fully stop scholarships within high schools. Because uh, it's, it's a way of making sure that it is also densed down into, um, you know, a select... 50 to 60 schools of where all the best players are going to. And then, and like it benefits both parties in terms of, it uh, benefits all parties in terms of the player getting recruited, the school that's receiving that kid uh, who's decided to take up the scholarship, and then also New Zealand Rugby who was happy that a kid went to a bigger rugby school where they can get better training and better coaching and better competition and then they'll also be able to you know, watch them from week to week instead of, um, you know, trying to chase them down at a, a, a small school uh, where no one wants to say what the score is or no one wants to give a report on the rugby game, no one wants to give a report on players, no one even wants to put up a score. Like, sometimes I find it so hard to find scores from schools that I, I, I'm interested in trying to find and I can't even find their scores or competitions or who where they played or who they played against or what competition they played in. Like some of these, uh, some of these smaller schools play in under nineteen uh, competitions, but you don't really know that. Like the, it's not told to you, and then you look on their school pages, and then it's not, you know, it's not provided. They don't, they don't talk about players. They don't talk about, you know, if kids did well or anything like that. And so, um, you know, smaller schools that that don't highlight those kind of things, players leave, and then they go to bigger schools, and then they're just easily tracked and stuff like that but that's kind of what i why i do what i'm doing in terms of making sure that all players uh, get at least some kind of um shine or, or recognition for the hard work that they put in um that week to you know to actually perform on the saturday i feel like that it's um i feel like it's important that we have something like this uh, in first 15 rugby and and having having someone um, report on kids and give them that sense that they're not just doing it in vain and that people are actually watching and concentrating and 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 seeing progress from you know from how they do from year to year, especially when I watch them from year ten all the way through to year thirteen, as they're like you know I've highlighted kids since they were year ten and. I've seen them grow and it's been fun watching them grow up and, and get better at rugby and then make it into all these teams and make it into the next level. Um, I mean, like, you know, like Nanai Williams and, you know, Quintu Pai and Tupova I like all those guys I saw when they were year 10 coming all the way through, you know, into into these huge positions of, 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 you know, achievement in the, in the national standings. But, um, and I, and I think if you've been following my page, it's like that kind of thing is that like you saw them the same time I saw them and I just reported what I saw and it just kept everybody on watch. And a lot of people wasn't surprising when Tupo made it. It wasn't surprising when, um, Quinn made it. It wasn't surprising when, um, you know, someone like Sevu in that and Will Jordan all made uh, the All Blacks. You know, like even Ethan, Ethan was the same. It was like, it wasn't surprising. Like he was, he was a mongrel when he was at school too. Like he was a, just this big tough guy. And I remember seeing him at, um, you know, I've been watching him since he was year 11. And then I saw him at, uh, at the top four and he's just the same kind of, big brooding tough guy that doesn't back down and, and it just carried through and showed and it still shows you know it's like i wasn't surprised when i saw far more also made the all blacks i was surprised at a young age but I'm not surprised that he's there but that's all the kind of things that we've seen it's so like when i think about how much this helps um with just confidence of all kids just the confidence of all kids that I mention them, that I talk about them, that I, that they know that someone is watching them. That's not their mum and dad and cousin and grandparent and you know best mate or anything like that. And then, 
just happy that someone goes, oh man, this, this dude had a great game. Like kids are happy with that. And parents message me and, and, and say thank you. And kids say thank you. And kids ask for advice and kids, um, are curious about who I am because they're just like, oh, well, yeah, I just don't know. Like, why, why would you come watch a game of us? You know, like, I went and watched Tuakal and Alfriston. I went and watched, you know, Southern Cross and um, Mount Roskill. Like, people don't, people in, like, nationally don't care about that stuff. I went and watched Tikawidu High School against Morrinsville. People don't care about that, but I do. Like, I care about watching, like, rugby first 15 games. I care about watching, if I could watch one every single day and I had the means to go and drive to wherever it was, then I'll do it. Like, uh, that's fun to me. You know, that's, that's to me, that's money well spent and that's time well spent. And, you know, I'd love to do that all the time. And But then, like, you know, we get to this part, like, right now, it's just like, well... If I'm not getting supported by people, if I'm not getting supported by companies um, that say that they're all for, you know, high school kids and, you know, progressing the game and, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's like, well, I think a lot of you guys are just talking a whole bunch of BS and really don't actually care at all, you know, because I've been doing this now eight years going on nine And it's just a bunch of talk from a lot of you companies out there. It really is just a bunch of talk. It really is just a bunch of cool emails going, oh, we'd love to jump on board and help you out. And we'd love to support this first 15 level and, and these kids coming through and being, and then it's just a bunch of talk and meetings. I've had a bunch of talks and meetings. I have a bunch of emails and just meetings. And that's all it really is. It's just meetings. And it, it it really annoys me and really annoys me because um, the professionalism side of it is is what we are lacking, I feel like. Going into the professionalism side of it from high school to professionalism is what we're lacking to everybody else in the world. And people and people that have been following this is not um, they all understand they know that this is not just a rugby page. It's not supposed to be just a rugby page. It's supposed to be for basketball. It's supposed to be for rugby league. It's supposed to be for netball. It's supposed to be for softball. It's supposed to be for volleyball and water polo and cricket and you know it's supposed to be for all sports. That's why it's called high school top two hundred, not first fifteen top two hundred. And I wanted to try and make it that there were a whole bunch of people like myself and all these different sports doing the same thing so that we can bridge the gap for our kids that they can go from high school into opportunities straight after high school to do the things that they love to do. I always, I still feel sorry for all the rowers out there. I still feel sorry for all the, uh, all, all the water polo players, boys and girls, all the, volleyball players boys and girls all the soccer players boys and girls uh, the basketball players boys and girls the league players and netball players and i feel sorry for all of them that they don't have a platform like mine where they can be looked up on a ranking and their name isn't out there a lot more i feel sorry that for that they don't get that recognition if i had started this with basketball there would have been a whole bunch more Basketball scholarships that would have come out of first 15, uh, out of the top 200 rankings for basketball boys and girls. I feel like our girls are a bit better and a bit uh, more prepared than our boys are in terms of uh, getting scholarships over in the States for D1 or D2 colleges. But if I had done this for basketball as well, uh, we would have been way ahead in terms of that, getting more boys and girls over there. If I had done this for volleyball, it would have been the same thing. If I did it for soccer, I think a lot more um, kids will be highlighted and in, in getting opportunities after this, especially with rowing as well. Is that like I've talked to a bunch of rowers? And it's like there's only a f- so few spots. If you think it's hard making in rugby, try being a rower and, and and what they have to go through. 
and then the decisions that they have to make in terms of like, well, do I take that scholarship over in the States or do I stay for the Olympics? And every kid here wants to be part of the Olympics. There's only, there's only a few spots. If you want to talk percentages and spots of, of having Olympic spots as a rower and then trying to battle out the guys who were their last Olympians and for new spots, like that kind of stuff is hard as hell. And like, I can understand why the Ivy Leagues come down here and and offer scholarships to our rowers. And I don't understand why a lot more of them don't take him. I know why they don't take him, but I don't understand it. Like, I don't understand the... Uh, the... I guess... I don't understand the ratio of options of which they have, like, you know, staying for that real low percent of making one of those, you know, seats in the boat, or do I go over to the States and then row over there for them and get an education for free, but based off a scholarship? You know, my thing would just be like, I'll just take a scholarship at Penn State, or I'll take a scholarship at, at Brown, or, you know, Harvard or Princeton or something like that or go to UCLA but you know or, or stay here and then hope that I get one of those seats for the Olympics you know like um, I wish that I had uh, I could do rowing as well and then make that make that stronger connection with all the rowers that we have here boys and girls and then just sort of filling up you know the college system over there with all of our rowers I would love to do something like that all those that miss out on the opportunity here and just have connections in the States to D1 colleges and just go, yeah, we've got a bunch of Kiwi kids that would love to come over. Oh, it would be the same situation that I'm in with NZR where the, you know, New Zealand rowing would be like, hey, what are you doing with all our rowers? It's like, well, what are you doing with all our rowers? That would be the same conversation that I'll be having. And I don't mind to be the bad guy in terms of those circumstances where the kids actually get the opportunities and that, you know, the big organization sits at the back and gets, you know, gets angry with me. It's like, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. But I can't just do that on my own. You know, like I need, I need support from companies. I need support. I need financial support from companies. I need um, guys who are like myself that don't like the way that things have been run within the sports that they love. I need those guys to stand up as well and jump on board with me and go, I'll do the ro I'll do the rankings for you for, for rowing and we'll try and find some funding. I'll do the rankings for netball and we'll try and find some funding. You know, I'll do the I'll do the volleyball ones and we'll try and find funding. You know, we'll just do that. That's what I that's what I want. I wanted to build it up like that and I'll take the heat from all these bigger companies and say, Hey, you're you you know, you're you're taking all our volleyball players away. I was like, okay, that's fine. I understand your side of it, but what are you doing with them while they're here? Because if they're not doing anything like Division One, or if they're not going to Europe and they're not playing, you know, uh, you know, club volleyball over in Europe where they can get paid for it, what are you guys going to do with them? Because I know the volleyball leagues in New Zealand and in different parts of the country are not strong at all. But then, what happens with those kids? That's my thing. That's always been my thing is like, what happens to those kids? Yes, you want them to play for New Zealand, but you can't offer them anything more than a national championship in high school. And then that next step is like a question mark. And it hasn't been made important enough for kids to stay around. I would rather them, I'd rather, you know, get familiar with, um, European teams and then going, okay, well, I've got a kid from South Auckland here. I've got a kid from Tauranga here. I've got a kid from down Christchurch. Um, th these are his highlights and this is what she can do. And um, let's figure out how we can do this for them. Like th those will be my steps for it. That's always been my, that's always been my, my plan of what high school top 200 was. And it's just high school top 200. It's not high school top 200 rugby. It's just high school top 200. And so like when I talk, when I think about like the, I guess, me progressing on with this, 
is that I'm trying to keep rugby alive and rugby pushing on so that I can keep that dream alive of having netball and basketball jump on board and, and league and volleyball and softball and all these other sports under it too. Because, I mean, I have the same thing with, with softball players too. And, like, obviously the softball community probably get annoyed. But for me, it's more about, well, how do we transition you from softball to baseball so that you guys can pick up scholarships in the States? And I know that we're a great softball nation, but in terms of, like, um, making a career of it that they can make money off it and become professionals is like softball is not really the sport. You know, softball is not the avenue where they, they can make money from it, but baseball is. And, and making sure that, and making an opportunity for them to turn that into something that they can do with baseball is just like, well, yeah, why wouldn't, why wouldn't you? For the boys, why wouldn't you? For the girls, it's like, well, let's find you some D1 scholarships over in the States so that you guys can go play softball and get an education. At the same time, as have an experience of, you know, being overseas and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Like, these are all the kind of things that I've thought about for years now. Like, I've always tried to build on that and try to um, get that into a position where we can do that. But with the way that rugby has turned out and I've and I've chose a sport of rugby because we all love rugby here in New Zealand it's the biggest sport that we have here but at the same time it's always just controlled by that by New Zealand by New Zealand rugby and and it's controlled by them having control over the competition over the players over the agents over the players association and I mean if you're staying close to the game like I am that that control is slowly slipping away it's it's slowly getting wiggled out of their grasp and they're going to have to do something really quick for them to have people stay on board or, or, or to stay within New Zealand because I mean like There's, there's a lot of things within the rugby circles that a lot of guys know about that New Zealand rugby have to do something quick to, to save it. And, and, and it doesn't even have to do with anything with COVID. It's got nothing to do with COVID either. It's got nothing to do with the financial loss that I had. They had troubles before that anyway. But for me, it's just like, well, I'm starting it from, a high school level to to keep kids interested and staying around and staying and staying put and and talking about how better New Zealand rugby is than anywhere else in the world and my pitch is always just like you know if you have something that's for you you can go take it go take it whatever the best opportunity is for you but in terms of rugby opportunity the best thing to do is stay in New Zealand but if it's personal, you know, opportunity, the best thing is to probably leave in terms of like money and finances. Now you can make it big somewhere else. You're not always going to play the best rugby though, because all the best rugby is here. And I've always advocated that to, to players as well. It's like, that's fine that you want to you know, take the money somewhere else. And that's great because that's, you know, that's what you want to do. And that's what you uh, will can take care of your family. But in terms of playing the best rugby that you can and making it sort of that way, is just like, well, the best option is to stay in New Zealand. I always said that. I just don't like the way that New Zealand rugby does it and the way that they they put it out there. Because it's just, like, to me, it just feels like a lock hold on, on, on New Zealand rugby through the black jersey. And it doesn't give you an option. It cuts you off. And then it also cuts you off. And it also, like, depletes you in the same way that um, if you play, if you're signed to another nation, you're not signed to New Zealand, then your pay packet gets cut by like thirty percent, which is like flipping horrible. To be honest, it's a horrible thing to 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 do. But it, it, that's the controlling side of it. That's why a team like Moana Pacifica is is important. That there's like a deal done there that you know keeps players all around and keeps them here, and the, you know don't really take away from 
uh, person's salary, but at the same time where they had that other deal from the other team from Hawaii. And, um, you know, I saw that one of that, that interview on my FM where they were going, yeah, well, we've got enough funding to, to pay people, you know, pay players up to a million dollars to stay with their team, to, to sign with their team, which is like a massive threat to New Zealand rugby and understand why New Zealand rugby said no to them. Because again, the control is, 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 uh, is loosening up and like you think about like think about all these young guys right like um th- like like the names that i've already just said like even like brandon enor like if brandon enor wanted to leave now and go to a european club or go to a japanese club how much money he would be pay- paid just because even if even if he didn't make the all blacks but how much he would get paid just making the crusaders You know, he's going to get more money somewhere else. Tupo Vai is going to do the same. Like, that's the reason why Stephen Lutua left. And, and you know, um, Charles Charles Piotr and that have left and they have gone and have gone at younger ages because they're like, yeah, I can pay for a lot more things earning that pound and yen and those euros because, you know, we're getting paid more somewhere, somewhere else. They're leaving at younger ages. Like... If Quintupaya wanted to leave now, like he could take care of his family and his future a lot more going somewhere else and he paid a lot worse going somewhere else. It's just the way that it is. That's why these guys take sabbaticals. But sabbaticals are only given to so few players. And you have to be like the best players, like Brody. Of course Brody's going to get one sabbatical, you know? Of course, those guys are going to get sabbaticals. Of course, Sam Kane could get a sabbatical or, like, you know, Kaino went and came back. You know, of course, these guys get sabbaticals, even Bowden Barrett and that. It's because that's who they are. But then, you know, they don't, they don't, like, make it, like, a secret, like, oh, yeah, uh, they're, going, they're going offshore not just to experience what Japanese rugby is like. It's like, no, it's to experience that yen that they're getting. It's way huge, way more than what we're getting here. But I mean, like, that's New Zealand rugby trying to compromise that that hold that they have. Now, it's it's not going to last for long. And at some point, you're going to have to let it go. But what what are you doing to have players stay and fall in love with it? Like, to me... It's about first the thing rugby. That's why I do it from this level. It's about them loving the rugby here, loving to stay here, wanting to be to be a chief or Blues player or Hurricanes player, like promoting it like that, promoting it that we see you, we see you even as a young guy, we see you, like we're paying attention, yeah. But has anyone seen that first 15 page that um, New Zealand Rugby has done? Yeah, neither have I. And I even went and had a meeting with them that I would do it. And they wanted me to change up a bunch of things. And I said, all right, as long as, you know, we can do that. And as long as we can still have some kind of ranking system, even if it was the schools. Even if we want to take a player, take away the player rankings, it's like, yeah, I'll, I mean, I'd be fine with that, but I mean, there has to be something there for kids to have some kind of gauge, you know? Like, you can't, you can't just call, you know, every player the best player. It's just not how it works. It's just not how it works. Like, why are we lying to kids like this? Why are we lying to 17-year-olds, 16 and 17-year-olds? They're not dumb. You know, they're not, they're not dumb. Like, kids aren't dumb. I feel like sometimes older people think that kids are dumb and they don't actually realize what's going on. It's like, no. You know, Otoranga High School is not going to, Otoranga College is not going to be upset that um, Hamilton boys, you know, are talked about more than them. Because they know what Hamilton boys is. You know, they're not going to go, oh, why don't, you, why don't you talk about our talent, the talent that we have? It's like, because they know that if they had a game, it'll probably be 100 points. 
They know that. They're not looking for recognition in terms of like, we want to be up there with the best. But they just want to be recognized. They just want to be like talked about. And they'll fine with it. Like none of those guys in, in Otoranga College or Tikuya High School or, you know, like from Danny Verk High School, are like they're not like thinking like, yeah, uh, why aren't we considered the best? It's like, because uh, Palmies down the road were fielding and they would put a massive score on you. And they know that. But for some reason, most of you older people just like want them to, it's like you're trying to, um, it's like you're trying to hide the fact that they're not as good as, good as other schools. It's like, you don't have to tell them that. They already know. They already know that, that they're not as good. Like, why Royal College knows that they can't beat Napier boys? Why Royal College probably knows that the third 15 will beat them from Napier boys? And so, like, the way that we are trying to explain things to kids and, like, even, like, taking away these rep teams is, like, is, is strange to me. It really is strange to me. Look, some kids don't even, you know, some kids know that they're not good enough to work for rep teams. And some of them are not angry that they didn't make it. But it's like, ah, missed out. I wasn't even considered anyway. Because they know each other anyway. A lot of kids know each other and who's the, who's the better players on their team. They know how many players, they know how many, you know, people on the team are considered or should be considered. Like, it's not, it's not, it's not a surprise to them kind of thing. But the parents and the people in, you know, that have control of these things think that every kid is heartbroken and that's why they're not playing rugby. It's like, well, that's not even the case at all. They're not playing rugby because gaming is, is flipping not as hard as going to training every single day. Or they saw something different on the internet and be like, hmm, I want to be a social influencer. I want to pull pranks on people. I want to put my time and energy into that. It's got nothing to do with the game of rugby and like, oh, I didn't make a rep team, so I'm not going to play this anymore. You know, Paraparu Women College is not going to be upset that Wellington beat them by a bunch of points because they're like, yeah, we know what Wellington is. We know what Wellington College is. We're just going to go out there and do our best. It's not hard to see why kids are falling off rugby or like even you know, netball or anything like that. It's just like, no, because I've seen other stuff on the internet and YouTube and they thought, yeah, I want to do that. Like, now that everyone has a lot more options, people think that it's the it's the, the imbalance of rugby in, in New Zealand. It's like, no, it's, it's got nothing to do with that at all. Not at all. It's got nothing to do with recruiting or or, or scholarships because that was done back in the days anyway. What, you think that, the, like, scholarships is like a new thing? Cut it out. Scholarships have been been given from even when I was at school. We had a boy leave from our school and went to St. St. Paul's Collegiate on a scholarship. There was us like that friendly banter and whatever, but it's like there was no hatred in it. There was no hatred in it at all. Like it wasn't a surprise. So yeah, he's getting a free schooling. Like who wouldn't want that? But scholarships is not what is killing, you know, rugby in New Zealand or dropping our numbers. It's like it's more opportunities. It's seeing different, different opportunities that are, that is out there. But for me, I want to report on the kids that want to play rugby. I want to report on the kids that love playing rugby that just want to play. They don't care about like you know, what team they're actually playing for. It's like, well, if I'm not playing first team, then I'm not going to play at all. It's like, no, it's like, yeah, I just want to play rugby. I, I don't care what, you know, grade I'm at. If I make the first team, great. If I don't, then it's like, okay, that's fine. 
You know, it's just like, I, I don't understand them. Like, you know, kids that want to play rugby, they just play rugby. There's, there's nothing else that would stop them from doing it. They just want to play rugby. It's got nothing to do with anything else. Like, oh, we're losing by heaps of points. I don't want to play anymore. It's just like, then they don't really want to play rugby. I don't, I don't see why, um, you know, New Zealand rugby is trying to blame it on anything else. It's like, like the excuse is like, oh, it's like this and that. And then it's like, no, it's just, there's just, just different opportunities out there. The world's a lot bigger when you got the internet. And because we want to try different things than what is like socially being the norm of just playing, well, if you're a girl, you play netball. If you're a boy, you play rugby. Then you play cricket in the summer. Like things like that. It's like, nah, it's different now because people love basketball. I've already complained about how terrible like New Zealand rugby is with their social media and, and, and showing rugby stuff. I was like, man, I would, if I, if I worked for New Zealand rugby in terms of like just the social, social media side of it, I'll change up everything. I'll go up there and change up everything. I'll change up everything and make sure that everything gets seen. I'll, I'll be, you know, I'll change every single platform that New Zealand rugby has and make sure that it's, it's, It's accessible to kids in small doses. That's all it is. It's so weird that they don't get that already. It's like, bro, flipping sharpen up, man. I know what you guys want kids to stay in it, but you want them to watch the whole game. It's like, you think kids are going to sit there and watch the whole game? Like, my daughter watches rugby with me. She's seven years old. She watches the anthem, the huckers, and then five minutes and goes, Dad, I'm going to go and play with my unicorns. Sweet ass. No kid is going to sit there and watch it unless they really love sports. They say really love rugby. Other than that, it's just a it's just a Saturday thing for them. That's fine. They don't need to. I bet I bet a bunch of professional players don't even watch rugby in the off time. They're probably gaming, to be honest. They're probably just gaming, which is like which is like not a surprise. It's not a surprise. They watch what they need to watch in terms of like what their framework and technique and the stuff that the team sends. And after that, they're gaming. They're out there playing golf. Getting lattes or whatever they do. Whatever you fuckers do. You know, like, yeah, of course. Like, what do you think? You think they're just like, consuming everything that's rugby? It's like, no, nah, they want to rest from that stuff. They're probably watching the NBA right now and probably watching the football right now. You know, I don't get what New Zealand rugby season is like, but that's where my thing comes into it too. Is that like, I do this from this level because I try and be honest with kids and try and um, explain to them the opportunities that they have here and over and overseas, but still with the fact that the black jersey does mean something. But I don't hold them to that to trap them into them them choosing that over something else it's like not at all but at some point we're going to have to be like soccer where it becomes like that because rugby is too worldwide we're going to have to be like soccer in terms of um how these international games are done and and the frame the framework of how it's done and like obviously it's going to be different because we're just a lot more physical in our game but at the same time is that there's too many leagues around the world, there's too many players travelling around the world that, you know, something has to be done with it. And holding them to, like, you can only play for the All Blacks if you're in New Zealand is going to change soon. Like, Charles Piotel to this day would still probably be in the All Blacks if, if they could let him play and, and play, play overseas and make the All Blacks. I 100% believe he would still be an All Black. And he'll be up in the, you know, 60s, 70s of games. Somewhere like that, you know. Or maybe 50s, 50s, something like that. But, you know, like, I think we just got to be a lot more realistic on it. And my realistic, you know, point of view comes from First 15 Rugby, which is why I did it from First 15 Rugby. And why I give recognition to all players that play rugby in first 15 or play rugby in high schools because that's all kids need most of the time is recognition and, and to know that 
um, uh, what what hard work that they put out is not in vain. They work they work really hard throughout the week. The week they work really hard at their schoolwork to play on the Saturday to make sure their grades are up to uh, you know up to the standard of which the first team wants you to do, and they put all that work in so they can still play on Saturdays. Now. Why can't you just give them the recognition for that? That's what I'm trying to do. It's just still give recognition for that. And to, and to show everybody as well, especially high school kids, is like, look, the professional the professional game is one to three years away from you. Now, if you want to be ready, then get ready. But I'm not going to tell you that that's not an option. I'm not going to tell you that playing first team rugby in high school is just fun because for some of you players, it's professionalism next year. Like Peter Lakai, like Harry Godfrey. You know, like guys like that. Like for AJ Faliofana, it's going to be next year. You know, all these guys are going to be, it's just next year. It's just two years away from it. Let's get used to it now. You know, put it in their head that that it's like, yeah, that's going to be your responsibility. And whether you take that opportunity to sign that contract, cool. If you don't want to, then don't want to. If you just wanted to play because rugby was fun for you and you just happened to be really good, that's great. There have been New Zealand secondary school players that have gone like, well, it was great that I made it, but that's not really what I wanted my future, future to be. Like, I'm more than just a rugby player. And they just pretty much gave up rugby and started, you know, studying. Which is awesome. That's how it should be. Play it if you want to play it. Don't uh, don't play it if you don't. But at least be realistic. At least be real. Like one thing, one other thing that like New Zealand rugby has got to change to me in terms of like, and there's this like internal argument of like how um, players are selected. Because, and, not, and I'm not just talking about um, First Athena, I'm talking about within, um, you know, the NPC and also in Super Rugby is because right now there's an argument of athletic players to, you know, position specific players. Do you go for the athlete or do you go for the, the guy who's a specific position player? The athletes that they're looking for now are like real tall guys, kind of like myself, who are part of the you know, the 6'2 the six, to 6'6 six, six guys that can run fast and, you know, real athletic, um, not really not really a, a technical position-specific player, but they can run and jump and fast and strong and all that kind of stuff. But then you've got the other side of it where you've got guys who are just specific position players that will do everything in that position perfectly and 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 then that's what they're going to give you but they may not just be 6'3 they might be smaller you know they may not be as mobile but they fit the standard of what you want and so like guys that are like especially like props you got props of which ones that are like that are like real big fast athletic guys but not so good when it comes to propping and lifting and all that kind of stuff in between but when it comes to the field work stuff they're great now, like, the balance of that is, like, where, well, do you want a guy who's, you know, fast and strong and explosive, all that kind of stuff, but can't scrum? Or do you have the guy that's, that, that can scrum, then he's not really fast and mobile around the field, but, you know, he's going to get you there in little bit, bits and pieces. Like, that's kind of, like, the argument that people are having now is, just like, what prop do you kind of want? Or what prop is getting selected? The big mobile prop that can run or the prop, the prop that is you know, excellent at scrumming and that's going to hold you and win you the ball at those moments. Like those are the kind of things that people are having arguments about. Even the open side position is just like, well, do we want an open side who can actually go and fetch the ball or a guy that just runs and tackles and hits hard, but he won't, he won't threaten that ruck in terms of a turnover. Same thing with our blind sides is the same thing. It's just like, do you want your blind sides to be, that big fast guy or do you want the guy to actually be solid on defense and be that supporting player because the fast guy can get around the field and he's going to give you a lot of options like that but then when it comes to those specific position um specifics they're not going to be able to do it they can't do that for you 
they can't get to the ball. They can't get over the ball. They can't stay over the ball. They can't. They can't um, tackle with technique and body position. And you know, uh, they may not know the game um, more than the others as well, which is the other kind of thing too. Is this, like, do you take time to teach the the athlete the IQ of the rugby game, or do you just leave it to the other side and go, I oh, will just take the IQ player, and then. Um, go with him because he knows what the game is about he knows what to do where the direction of the game is going all that kind of stuff instead of the athlete who just sort of just is a step behind um, IQ wise but he can make up for it in athleticism that kind of stuff they also have it with like uh, like wingers and fullbacks as well they're also trying to figure out like what do we what do we want for this what what do we choose who do we bring through because that's the that's the argument from the first 15 position is that the first 15 and making it into reps is like, well, do we take that kid who's six, you know, who's six five right now? Uh, he's okay and he's like really fast and strong and explosive and stuff, and we'll just try and teach him the position and see if he catches on. Or do you take, you know, the six footer um, open side who steals the ball? You know, like that kind of thing. I mean, like, um, what's his. Uh, Vivini is probably the other is probably the perfect example, I think, where he was at Tauranga Boys, plays for Bay Plenty now as an open side, and he didn't get picked up um, for New Zealand secondary schools or even the Barbarians because they didn't like his height. They didn't like how small he was. But he was the guy that was stealing the ball all the time in every single game that I watched. But then they didn't want to pick him up because of his, you know, the, the height requirements and stuff. It's like, well, does it really matter when you've got a guy that can steal the ball? Like, he's just a jackal everywhere. But then you want to take the guy who's 6'2", who can, you know, run fast and it just looks impressive, you know, running around. And he's like, oh, wow, he's got good height. He looks like a big guy, but then he doesn't actually do the job that he's there to do. He just looks great and intimidating on the field. He's fast. But, I mean, like, Vivini is probably the guy that uh, that comes to mind first. It's just like, well, we're going to get to a point where, um, you know, I mean, like, look, look at the halfbacks. Like, the argument of halfbacks that they're having is, like, do we keep with the traditional small guys or go with the bigger guys that are, you know, a lot more physical and they don't have the most accurate passing or, like, things like that. But... You know, uh, size-wise, they look great. You know, speed-wise, they look great. Um, some of them, uh, some of them, the ones that they're selecting, uh, come off to be a bit more too aggressive and too ball, you know, hold on to the ball too much instead of letting that thing fly. Same thing with first fires is they're doing the same thing as where they're going, well, this guy's got great footwork and speed and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, yeah, but does he hold the ball too long or does he know when to give it off or does, it, does his mind just take over and he just takes off? You know, it's, it's things like that. I mean, like, there's an argument now. I mean, if you take the two best first five that we have in New Zealand, which is, you know, Ta Kemera and um, AJ Faleofunga, it's just like two games that are, are two completely different games, but then it's just like, well, which one do you want better? Like, which one do you prefer better? The game management guy of, of AJ who can run, but he chooses to kick around the field find the spaces in the back, get that ball to go along, and then he picks out the chances when he wants to attack, because he can. Or do you take Taha's side of it? Where Taha's just like this explosive guy with massive footwork, and they can break the line, and he's he's willing to put his body on the line to get the break, which he usually does. Whether it's the break for himself or the offload to the guy who's making the break, which is, which, which he does perfectly, you know, it's just like those are the arguments that he's like, are you going to take one or the other, the position specific guy, or the athlete guy? Now that whatever those arguments are, that's what they're having in New Zealand rugby, which is falling to the side of athleticism. Is that a lot of it is going to athleticism, which is which is fine, but some of those athletes don't catch on well to the IQ of rugby sometimes. 
they're just playing what they're seeing in front of them and, and, and are not thinking, you know, a few phases ahead. Which, which loses out on those guys that do know rugby. You know, which do know, who do know what's going on. Like Vivina knew what was going on. He knows what, what's going on. He knows when to pinpoint what's happening. Those kind of guys are the ones that we're sometimes le- losing. You know, even some of these props and um, even some of these locks, some of these locks are, are way too athletic and explosive, but then they can't do the core roles of like even holding themselves in the lineout sometimes. Some of them can't even do simple lineout work where they are getting chosen for as lifters rather than jumpers, which is strange to me sometimes. You know, where they're going more to a number six or a number seven, it's just like, well, why do those guys have better hands than you? You know, why they picked up, why they called for more than you're called for? You know, why is the play called for them? It's like, because they don't really have great hands. They're, they're great athletes, but when it comes to these core roles, it's like, it's different. Even when it comes to scrumming, some of these tall athlete guys in, in those lock positions are not great behind the props bums. Like, and they, and they buckle too much or they're too high or they're not, you know, the, the they, they just don't have any strength behind their bum to to actually hold themselves. Like those kind of things is, you know, is a worry. But that's like one of those things that's happening right now in New Zealand rugby where um, selectors are going through those kind of things. And like and like New Zealand rugby is not the only one that's done it. And like New Zealand rugby is not the only one that's struggling with this because I mean, American football, NFL and NBA struggle with that too. The NBA at one point were... They, the hype was drafting guys because they thought everyone was going to be like Lamar Odom and, and guys like that, like Anton Walker, who were all these guys that could do everything. But they really didn't have like a position. And that's, and, and that's why basketball sometimes in a way, in the way that's turning out now, is that it's positionless basketball. But at the same time, when it comes down to specifics, some of these players don't even know how to do their own specific roles of what a small forward is or what a shooting guard is. Sometimes a shooting guard can't even shoot. He's just an explosive wing player who can slash to the basket, who's real athletic and get up in the air and all that kind of stuff. It's like, yeah, but most of them can't even, you know, hit a jumper. And not even like an elbow jumper or like a 10-footer. Like, they can't even do that. And a lot of them are jacking up threes and shouldn't actually have the green light to jack up threes. But because the game is so fast and they have all these athletic players is that the shot clock, which is just 24 seconds on the shot clock, is only used within the first 12 seconds because they want to pop off all these shots and you're getting more shots within the game. But at the same time, they're not really shooting. They're shooting, but not making it. The percentage is pretty low. You know, um, NFL was the same where they, they started looking at guys who were edge rushers and guys that were... Um, defensive ends um, slash linebackers slash safeties, uh, strong safeties who were coming up into the line on defense and then they were like, wow, yeah, they can rush and they can hit these gaps, but then when they have to drop back is they, they can't drop into, into their zone. They're too big to drop back. They're now sort of testing this thing where they have cornerbacks who are 6'3", 6'4", that's 6'3", 6'2", 6'3", who in a way can keep up with the run of these um, wide receivers, but at the same time, don't have that um, that IQ of a cornerback that know how to cut off routes and that know how to get into the face, that know how to play arm to arm defense and to hide that hold just to get that advantage. It's the same thing with with um, uh, left tackles and right tackles. Is that these left tackles became a lot more athletic, but had no real bulk, so they went with speed, but then they changed only because. The defensive ends and the edge rushes became skinnier. They became more explosive, all that kind of stuff. But then you lost the, you lost the the grunt out of a lot of these guys too. Even when the guards started switching up, and then because you had guys like Aaron Donald, you I mean when you look at someone like Warren Sapp to Aaron Donald, who was smaller, six footers, um, real explosive, that kind of stuff. But then you had other guys like Will Fox and you know Nick and Sue, who are these big brooding guys and all that kind of stuff. Then if those things are going to change, then your guards have to change, then your centers have to change. And then you go through all these things where you're going, wow, the specific player who's there for that specific position, and they're changing this, it's like, well, are we having athletes or what? Some of these athletes will go and then they'll, you know, they don't know when to switch off 
of, of being an athlete and playing the technical game that which is supposed to be in their position you know cutting off routes you know blocking up holes blocking up gaps and whether to hold or to advance like things like that and seeing what screens are like some athletic players are, are too worried about breaking into that gap instead of seeing a screen that's set up where guys are just hitting them from the side and they're trying to go forward they don't realize if you just went with it you're going to be in the middle of that screen and make the tackle anyway things like that is like uh, as, as an argument that is not just a New Zealand rugby argument of athleticism versus specific player uh, position specific players like it happens in all those sports but it's like we haven't really learned from how these other sports have done it and how it has failed because uh, to me sometimes at the 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 trying to find that athlete that can switch but then they're giving up they're giving up too much on these guys that can already do it anyway and they're not using these athletic guys as projects of like oh we'll see what happens they're actually putting them in there and then it's not working out and in turn you're losing some of these guys that are um, you know that are in those specific positions and they can play it on purpose or like they can play it with all purpose of of how the position should be played but they're just losing out on those selections and then they see this other athlete that comes up again in high school and goes oh we should try that guy because it's like why when you've got that guy that's left two years ago still playing really good club rugby and should probably be in there because he's doing it in club rugby as well but then you see this other athlete from high school and you're like oh we should try that kid 6'5", really, really strong, really fast, explosive. It's like, yeah, but he doesn't read the game like that guy. I would just take a chance. That's kind of the argument that's happening now. Uh, especially within the rugby circles and, and, and what happens and you know how it, how it plays out is going to be uh, important for how um, rugby carries on in New Zealand. Because we don't actually know if, actually, if it's actually making a, a difference or if it's even working, you know, even in the All Blacks, we have a lot of, you know, athletes in the All Blacks, but to me, sometimes some of them aren't working out and they haven't been working out, but they've stayed in there, they've kept them in there and it's the, the long process of it, to me, hasn't paid off. It hasn't paid off and it didn't pay off, but they stayed with it, which is strange to me, I think, because by the time you get to All Blacks, you should already recognize or realize um, through Super Rugby that 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 won't pay off or that's not playing paying off in, in Super Rugby. So I don't actually know why we would put them in the All Blacks. The Super Rugby is supposed to be the testing run, really, I think, right? Well, anyways. Um, yeah, uh, like, like I said, like if I carry on to high school top 200... Um, and if I give it up, I would set up next year anyway. I would set up next year with the top 200 rankings, um, a year 12 rankings, uh, and a year 11 rankings, and even like a top 100 school rankings. And I'll set that up at the beginning of the year and to just leave it throughout the year. And just so that everyone has something to look at in terms of that's what I thought it would be from the beginning of the year, but I won't change it if I, if I don't choose to do it next year. So... Uh, yeah, um, but that's uh, that's my uh, that's the podcast for today. Um, I'll continue on every every week uh, for the Monday morning meeting until uh, next year, and then I'll I don't know, I'll decide what I'm going to do. I'm not too sure what, but I'll decide what I'm going to do. But it's uh, high school top two hundred. Hershey for all, peace.